God says, I will give my power. I want to pause there just for a minute, and I want to explain to you and express to you that God has never been stingy with his power. Any amens? God has never been stingy with his power. Jesus said this, the Gospel of Matthew, he said this. He said, what father among you, when you had a child come to you and ask for bread, would you give him a stone? What father among you, when your child came and asked for a fish, would you give him a scorpion? Now, how much more so when God's children, Jesus said this, ask for the Holy Spirit, would he ever limit that? How would he ever limit that? God has always been very, very free with giving his Holy Spirit. And I want to make this statement that none of you lack any of the Holy Spirit only for asking it. You may be filled completely. As well, you must make yourself available to that power. Anytime we limit the Holy Spirit, it's us holding back, not God holding back. So be powerful. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Any of us can do that. Matthew chapter 7, I cited that. One day in the Old Testament, Moses was being asked to... Uh, distribute the Spirit on 70 leaders in Israel. Um, it had been noticed that Moses was up day and night nearly answering questions and uh, solving issues among God's people. And they gathered together. And Joshua said this, um, uh, when the Spirit fell on these leaders that there were two absent. They were still out there in the tent area. And they started prophesying like the other 68. And Joshua said, uh, uh, Moses, uh, those two over there, they're prophesying also. You know what Moses said? Would unto God that all his people would prophesy, that all God's people would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that all would be preachers, that all would be teachers and leaders and witnesses. Would unto God that all of them would. Nowhere. Do we ever see that God is stingy with his Holy Spirit or with his power? Here, in particular, two witnesses are standouts. The Old Testament law was that there had to be two witnesses so that none would question just one witness. These two witnesses are standouts, and let me mention this, that in our New Testament, and if I recall, it's Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that is a description of the spiritual gifts. These two are witnesses. Some of us are teachers or preachers, or we have the gifts of helps or administration. These are two standout witnesses, and we will see this, and they have the gift of prophecy. Now, before we get any further, I want to mention this, that their message lasted three and a half years. Sometimes I get a little bit antsy if I see the clock up there going past noon. Okay, some of you get a little... I've seen people do this to the preacher, all right? All right, I've, I've seen people do that, okay? Listen, these, these guys... Well, let me, let me turn it right side up because that gave me a lot more time. That doesn't, okay? Their message lasted three and a half years. So if I make you late for lunch today, well, we got a, a little foretaste. We have an appetizer for lunch today in communion, right? I'm being too lighthearted. Their message lasted three and a half years. I want to say this, that in 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, the love chapter, we're told this. Verse 8 says that prophecies shall end. Uh, may I make a statement? I'm not so sure that many of these things actually have ended. Uh, I'm not clear about that in my own theology, and my own understanding of God's word. Uh, it, it says the gift of healing will end. Uh, the gift of prophecy will end. I don't know if it's they're dead now or not. Uh, we pray for people. Bunny attested to the fact that we prayed for her, and she's got a cure. It's happening, right? All right? So uh, 
God uses doctors, amen? Uh, every visit you make, you help them pay for a Porsche or a Mercedes or a, uh, a Bentley, right? Okay. <laughs> but they're instruments in God's hand, but most doctors would say they ain't God, amen? And so we pray to the great physician, and God uses the physicians here on earth, and there's things that happen. Uh, the preacher uh, is used by God. I, I hope and I pray, I trust, right? Uh, he might have a word of prophecy, but I will say this. Please listen to me clearly. I'm not claiming to be a prophet, okay? When we are here on earth, sometimes our messages are hit or miss. And because of that, I am very, very, very skeptical of ever saying anything about prophecy except it comes from where? The book, all right? So many of us hit or miss. If that gift of prophecy is actually dead, these two witnesses uh, experience a resurgence of it. Get me? And God gives them messages of prophecy, and they preach, they prophesy for three and a half years. I've had it explained this way, that preaching is telling forth whereas prophecy is forth-telling. Get it? And I'm leery of ever uh, the one versus the other. I can't forth-tell, but I can tell forth. The criteria of any prophecy, as the Bible explains it, is that it must come true 100% or the prophet be stoned. That's what the Old Testament uh, criteria was. These two step forth and they are dressed strangely. I'd like to make this statement. These two prophets are dressed in sackcloth. Many of you know what sackcloth is. It's burlap. Some of you ages past had dresses that were made out of feed sacks, right? Right? Uh, and that's even smoother than burlap, right? These guys are dressed in sackcloth, burlap. And may I say this? Jesus said it, actually, about John the Baptist. He said, uh, did you go out there to the Jordan River to expect somebody in fine, soft clothing? No, uh -uh. not at all. This week, I got an email and it was a nice little message, and I read it. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Currently, an uh, opinion poll was taken, and of those Christians, one-third of them said that their preacher has made this statement from the pulpit, God wants you rich. One-fourth of Christians today say that their preachers make this announce, announcement. You put money in that offering plate, and God will multiply it back to, to you countless ways. I am here to give you an anti-message. God wants you poor, because then you only depend on him and, quote, not what's in your wallet. Does that sound more biblical to you? It surprises me, it amazes me that people stand up and preach things that are not in the Bible, and people love it. These guys are not dressed in silk. They don't have Rolexes on their, watch, or their wrist. They're not well, wearing medallions that flash, and they're sackcloth. And all they are doing is delivering God's message, verse 4, describes them further. They are two olive trees. They are Jews. In the Bible, we see fig trees, grapevines, cedar trees, all representing Jews. They are two lampstands standing before God, meaning that they are getting light and giving light. 
It is impossible for anyone to preach or teach before they stand in the presence of God. Lampstands cannot give out light unless they get a source of light. And I believe that's why so much preaching is darkness instead of light. I got a feeling that most preachers spend more time out on the golf course than they do on their knees. Ooh, did I just say that? These are in the presence of God, and they're giving out light because they're getting in light. Dear teachers, please spend time in the presence of God, and people will not be able to resist your message. But in verse 5, these two particular witnesses are wanting to be harmed. They, others are wanting to harm them. Thank you. Others are wanting to harm them. They want to kill the messengers. The message is God's. They are the mouthpiece. People want to kill the messengers, but the message exists because it's eternal. Amen? It's in the book. Here it is. They want to harm them. And yet, verse 5 says, fire comes from their mouths. Okay, listen to me one more time. Fire can't come out of your mouth unless fire is in your heart. I heard this say one, said one time. I do believe it. You set the preacher on fire and people will come. These guys were on fire because they were in the presence of the fire. The fire was down in their heart. And if anybody chose to try to harm them, fire came out of their mouths. Let me tell you what I did last Sunday morning. While I was on vacation, very early, I got the two nephews from France, and we went out, and we went fishing for a while. Got back, everybody was going to have American breakfast. All right? The French nephews call it American breakfast. They don't get it over there. Bacon, eggs, Biscuits, gravy, am I making you hungry yet? That was pretty early, about 6 o'clock in the morning. So we had some fun, and my two nephews from France call me do wacky do Uncle do wacky do all right? It's because of this, watch. All right, okay, all right, that's all, that's all. So we got back to the house, and breakfast wasn't ready yet. And so we had church on the front porch, but this is how it happened. Long story. If I'm not done today, will you come back next Sunday? Uh, Good, okay. Traveling with my relatives from France is a young lady who is girlfriend to one of my nephews that has a 13-year-old daughter. They're from Sri Lanka. And there is great Muslim influence in Sri Lanka. And so when we got back from fishing, sat on the front porch, and Ashika asked me a question. She said, my relatives from Sri Lanka are telling me that I should not eat pork. And right then and there, I knew that she was being influenced by Muslims. And so I said... Can I explain to you what Jesus said from the Bible? Uh, And Jesus said, it's not what goes into you that makes you unclean or immoral. It's what comes out of you. And then I said this. I said, dear Ashika, you need to read the Bible, and I'm going to give her one before she goes back, and she's promised to read it. I said, you need to very, very carefully decipher what people are telling you because, and I cited the statistics that I had used here a couple of weeks ago, that there are 56 Muslim countries in this world and 21 of them are controlled by militant Muslims who think it's their job to either pay people to convert to Muslim, Islam, or hold a gun to their heads. And I said, Dear Ashika, tell me something. What good does it do if you don't eat pork but hold guns to people's heads? Tell me 
How does that make 